After five years of living in one cabin, Joe and Matt finally get to know each other's grim and bloody backstories. On Christmas Day, Joe Potter wakes up in a cabin in the middle of the frozen wilderness. He briefly checks himself in the mirror, then caresses a picture of a woman tucked beside it. As he heads to the kitchen, he's greeted by Matt Trent, who seems to be in holiday spirits. Joe turns off the jolly Christmas music, and this catches Matt's attention. Still, Matt happily shares that he's making them roasted potatoes to celebrate Christmas. He suggests talking while having a meal would be good, considering that they've barely spoken to each other despite staying there for five years. Matt insists on having a conversation, but Joe isn't big on conversations, suggesting that he'd bore his companion. Matt, however, points out that it's better to be bored by anything else than the snow. Due to his insistence, Joe asks what he wants to talk about. Matt's face lights up, and he asks Joe why he accepted the job in the outpost, knowing that nobody gets sent there unless they've caused trouble. However, Joe is reluctant to answer and shoots the same question back to Matt. Matt finds this interesting, so he shares his story. Matt made a living out of talking to people. He calls himself a guru, but to put it simply, he was a dating coach for dweeby men. Using a device implanted in people's eyes called Z-Eye, coaches can stream what their clients see and instruct them on what to do. One night, Matt directed his socially awkward client, Harry, into bagging a girlfriend. He told him what to wear and how to act and even suggested crashing into a Christmas office party. Matt explains to Joe that women let their guard down at Christmas work parties after being stuck with their annoying workmates for a year. After Matt instructed Harry to grab an empty beer bottle as a prop, he noticed that his client already fancied a dark-haired girl, so he told him to approach her group. But he must exclude her from the conversation. Harry confidently shared a story with them, which he had practiced with Matt beforehand. The girl's co-worker, Amy, seemed interested, but their male co-worker interrogated Harry because he hadn't seen him before. Matt quickly searched for the man's profile and found that his name was Dawson. In his profile, he saw that Dawson went to a barbecue party wearing a funny hat, so he instructed Harry to mention this and pretend they met during then. After this, this, he casually asked Amy to be introduced to the girl he liked, Jennifer. Matt explains to Joe that his tactic is to freeze out the one that his client was actually interested in. People like to be included, but Jennifer seems content with being ignored. Seeing that she's no longer relevant, Jennifer leaves the circle, challenging Matt's skills. As Amy babbled on, Harry excused himself to the bathroom. It turned out that Matt wasn't the only one who saw the streamed footage. A bunch of his colleagues was also tuning in and teaming up to provide insights. At the party, Harry saw Jennifer sit sitting by herself. The other men on the call said nobody else was hitting on her, so something must be off. However, Harry approached her and found that they have a commonality in being social outcasts. As they talked, Jennifer shared that parties were too noisy, and she only got through last year's party because she was using recreational substances, though she was sober now. After more talking, Harry suggested going somewhere quieter. Matt explains to Joe that his tactic is effective because people like to be heard. He adds that 90% of seduction is listening and focus, something that Joe isn't doing. Instead, Joe stares at a clock on the wall, saying that he's seen it somewhere before. Matt disregards this and continues the story. Harry and Jennifer ended up in a quiet part of the building, where Jennifer shared that she was leaving the company. She hesitated to go through with it, but Harry empathized with her, saying that the voices in his head could make him doubt his choices. When Jennifer asked which voice he listened to, he said that he chose the one that told him to do it. This inspired Jennifer. As the two made a toast, Jennifer spilled her drink on Harry's pants, so she wiped it. The men in the call went wild as Jennifer touched him. He offered to get her a new drink, but she excused herself to the bathroom. While she was away, Harry talked to Matt, not knowing that Jennifer was back and watching him like he was talking to himself. Suddenly, she approached Harry and asked him to come home with her. She said she listened to the voice that said, do it, and she also wanted to show her gratitude. To convince him, Jennifer kissed him. Joe asks if Matt watched what the couple was about to do, so his companion companion assures him that he didn't watch since his job was done. In truth, Matt and his colleagues were still watching everything as the couple arrived at the apartment. There, Jennifer told Harry to head to the bedroom while she got drinks. While Harry talked to Matt about how nervous he was, he failed to notice that Jennifer was back with the drinks. In her eyes, he was talking to himself again. Just then, she told Harry to get on the bed then sat on his lap. She made him drink, but he cuffed over how strong the drink was and asked what it was called. Jennifer merely said it'll free them from the voice in their heads. Meanwhile, the men on the call were growing bored and wanted the real action to begin. However, Jennifer suddenly shared that she stopped taking her medications because they dulled the voices. 
these voices always spoke in her head. And now that Harry motivated her to listen to them, she was finally giving in to killing herself. Harry coughed blood as he realized too late that Jennifer had schizophrenia. Jennifer drank from the glass, then stuffed a funnel into Harry's mouth and forced him to drink the rest. Hearing the story, Joe flat out says she killed him. He asks how Matt found out about it, and he claims that he saw it on the news. However, Matt lied as he saw the crime take place. As Harry gurgled on his own blood, Matt told the men on the call to delete everything. He also gathered all the devices he used to dispose of them. As he went downstairs, he accidentally stepped on some toys, waking his wife, Claire. When Claire discovered Matt's involvement in the crime, she blocked him in her Z-eye. This means she could no longer hear or see him, and he appeared as a static image in her eyes. Matt shares with Joe that Claire eventually left and took custody of their daughter. This was how he ended up on the outpost because he didn't want reminders of his old life. Suddenly, the front door slams shut, and this alerts Joe. However, Matt claims not to hear anything and continues eating. Matt calls Joe a locked box, which is good because some people are easy to read, especially when they know minds just like him. Joe replies that picking up girls isn't knowing their minds, so Matt justifies that it was only a hobby. His real skill applies to his actual job. In a large hospital room, a woman named Greta prepared herself for an operation. With advanced technology, people can now eat before an operation. However, Greta noticed that her toast was slightly burnt, so she expressed her disapproval of this to the nurse. She knew it might be more work for the nurse, but she couldn't stand the tiniest bit of imperfection. As she got sedated later, Greta remained conscious. She heard what was happening around her but couldn't see or move. Greta panicked and saw herself coming out from her own body. The doctor announced that the cookie had been extracted. Then Greta screamed as she was placed in a portable electronic device. Later, Matt greeted her, explaining that she wasn't really Greta but a copy of her consciousness which was placed in a processor called a cookie. The real Greta, the one who wasn't a copy, paid for this special service. However, the copy was overwhelmed by not having a body, so Matt gave her a simulated version of herself. He explained that her task was to ensure that everything in the real Greta's house was according to her liking by using a control board. However, the copy refused to comply, insisting that she was an actual person and not a servant. Matt asked if she preferred to do nothing, and before Greta's digital copy could answer, he said the device's time perception to three weeks. Three weeks passed in the copy's simulated world despite mere seconds passing by for Matt. This drove her crazy, but when Matt asked if she was ready to work, she still refused. Because of this, Matt set the time to six months. This finally made the copy snap, and when Matt returned, she begged for something to do. Just then, the original Greta came downstairs, and Matt assured her that his job was done. Before he left, he flirted with Greta with the same story that he taught Harry. As the days passed, the copy got used to assisting in Greta's everyday routine ensuring that everything was according to her liking. Joe blatantly says this was promoting enslaving people, but Matt argues that the copy was made out of code, so it doesn't matter. He realizes that Joe is empathetic, so he must be a good man. Joe falls quiet over this comment, so Matt encourages him to share his story. Joe hesitates, but then he starts his story. Years ago, Joe had a girlfriend, Beth. Although they were good together, Joe acted stupid when he was drunk. One time, they went to a local pub, and Joe drunkenly sang karaoke. When it was Beth's turn to sing, he cheered her on too loudly, which embarrassed her and led her to bring him home. Days later, they invited their friends Tim and Gita for dinner. Throughout the meal, Beth remained quiet and drank a lot of wine. When their friends left, Joe asked if she was alright, and she explained that she wasn't in the mood. Joe continued to clean the kitchen while she excused herself for bed. Shortly after, Joe accidentally tumbled over the trash bin and found a positive pregnancy test. He happily marched to the bedroom where Beth was, and he asked if she was pregnant. Although he was overjoyed to be a father, Beth didn't want to keep the baby. Just then, Joe realized that Beth was drinking all night for a reason, so he called her selfish. She didn't want to listen to his harsh comments, so she blocked him in her Z-eye. Because of this, Joe smashed a vase against the wall and left the room after. The next morning, Beth packed up to leave for good. As she approached her car, Joe tried to run after her, pleading for them to fix things. However, he remained blocked in her Z-eye, so his words were nothing but muffled noises. This allowed her to leave without hesitation. That day, Joe stayed home, trying to contact Beth. However, a week after, he couldn't take it anymore, so he went to her workplace. There, he saw Tim and Gita and learned that Beth had quit her job, 
and no one knew where she was. Joe was lost at this point, and he couldn't even wallow in his sadness properly because the block blurred out every piece of information about the person, even their photos. Taking out the Zed eyes wasn't even an option. One day, Joe went out of town and saw Beth. Even with mere glitches, he could tell that she kept the baby and was pregnant. Desperate, he ran to her and begged her to turn off the block. However, Beth freaked out, and passersby reported Joe to the police. Because of this, the block now has legal backing, and if he went within 10 meters close to Beth, he'd get arrested. After this, Joe thought of other ways to make amends with Beth, so he wrote a letter and sent it to her dad's address. Despite sending multiple letters, he got no response. Eventually, Joe remembered that Beth spent every Christmas at her dad's place, so on Christmas Day, he hid in the woods and waited for her. After Joe had waited the whole day, Beth arrived with her dad, and they had had the baby. However, Joe couldn't tell if his child was a girl or a boy because legal blocks cover offspring too. Since then, Joe kept returning every Christmas and witnessed his child grow. In the fourth year of his annual visit, he left a present for the child, and to his delight, he discovered that she was a girl. As Matt listens to Joe's story, he asks if he went again the following year. However, Joe says that something happened before his planned visit. A few months before Christmas, Joe casually saw on the news that Beth had died in a train crash. Because because of this, the block was gone, and he finally saw her face after so many years. Although heartbroken, Joe looked forward to seeing his daughter, so he wrapped a snow globe as a present for the girl. Soon, he drove to where Beth's dad lived and found the girl in the garden. However, when she turned to see him, Joe was shocked after seeing that she had East Asian features. Joe realized that Beth cheated on him with Tim, which explained why she wanted to get rid of the child and why she was so eager to block him. The child led Joe to the kitchen, where Beth's dad was cooking. After seeing Joe, Beth's dad told the girl to go upstairs. When they were finally alone, he admitted that he got rid of Joe's letters before Beth could read them. He told Joe to leave, but the man was still in disbelief and demanded to see his daughter. Beth's dad yelled that he had had no daughter, so Joe lost his temper and hit the old man with a snow globe. Joe watched in shock and confusion as the man drew his last breath. While Joe shares all of this with Matt, he gazes at the clock on the wall and finally remembers that it's the same one from where Beth's dad lives. Although he's panicking, Matt tells him to focus and continue the story as if he's interrogating him. Complying, Joe says that he just left after that, then aimlessly drove around and got drunk. He lived in the streets for a few months until the police found him and questioned him. However, Joe didn't tell them what happened because admitting it would mean that it was real. Wanting more details, Matt asks what happened to the little girl. Before answering, Joe realizes that they're in the same cabin where he killed Beth's dad. However, Matt tells him to focus. Finally, Joe shares that he only knows what the police told him. The girl found her dead grandfather in the kitchen and went outside to get help but she froze to death near a tree in the garden. As Joe shares this, he sees the image of the dead child from the window. Suddenly, Matt asks Joe if he confesses. Triggered by guilt, Joe cries out and says that he confesses. Hearing this, Matt breathes in relief, saying that he finally did it. Joe looks at him, all confused. So Matt apologizes before disappearing. Matt then wakes up, removing his head from a box in an office filled with detectives, who praised him for getting a full confession. Matt claims that Joe knew he was guilty, so making him unload his pain was a surefire way to make him confess. A woman then tells Matt to wait while she goes to the real Joe's cell. She congratulates him on his full confession, which they got from a cookie they took from his brain, much like Greta's. While the real Joe kept silent, the copy revealed the whole truth. The woman returns to the office, and Matt immediately asks her about their deal. In exchange for getting Joe's confession, he asks to be free from all his charges. The detectives tell him that he's free to go, but his charges regarding his involvement in Harry's death are way too brave to be tolerated. Because of this, he'll walk free but be blocked from everyone. As Matt goes out, he sees everyone in static silhouettes. This will be his world for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, a detective manipulates the time perception on Joe's digital copy, putting him at 1,000 years per minute. Another detective catches him, so he explains what he did. He asks if she wants him to turn it off, but she tells him to leave it on throughout Christmas. With that, the detectives leave their office to enjoy their holidays. In the simulated cabin, Joe gets annoyed by the holiday songs on the radio so he smashes the device on the floor. When he turns back, he sees the radio still there, playing the same song. He breaks it repeatedly until he ends up crying on the floor, screaming like a madman. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.